Hey guys, we're about to start part seven, but before we do, I just want to take a few seconds to give a shout out for the uh, short film called Reign of Judges. Uh, if you guys haven't seen this video or heard about it, it is a short concept film of the war chapters of the Book of Mormon. Um, it's not just your average cheesy church movie, it's, it's high budget. They spent um, over like $200,000 making it. Uh, the, the guy who's making it, his name's Darren Southam. And, you know, they, uh, they went all out on this movie. They, uh, hired actors, um, Ben Cross, Eugene Brave Rock, Karina Lombard. Um, these are people who have been in, you know, the 2009 Star Trek, Wonder Woman, uh, Legends of the Fall. So this is, this is a really, high budget short concept film and the purpose for it is to raise enough awareness and enough money at least 20 million dollars in order to make this a high quality high budget film even better than the concept film um, darren's got a whole script written out i've read the first 20 pages and after reading the first 20 pages and seeing the short concept film i want to see this movie it, it gives me like a a Last of the Mohicans vibe. And the movie takes place in a North American Hopewell Mound Builder Civilization setting. And the Hopewell Mound Builder Civilization matches up so, so in sync with the Nephite and Lamanite culture. It's just, it's just amazing. So, how can you see the short film? Uh, first of all, there's a link down in the description box below. If you click on that link, you'll be able to see it for free by December 13th of 2019. If you're catching this video after December 13th, you can still buy the Blu-ray and DVD. And finally, how can you help them raise at least $20 million to make the full feature film? When you go to the link and watch the 15 minute film and the behind the scenes, if you, if this is anything that you desire to want to see as a movie, you can make a donation. Even if it's just a few bucks, every little bit helps. And also be sure to share the link with your family and friends through email, text messages, or private message. And uh, again, donate whatever you can. Every little bit helps. Part 7. Native Americans with Hebrew and Other Middle Eastern Ancestry Alright, this section probably should have been Part 1 because it's loaded with solid evidence. But I'm kind of glad that it's Part 7 because even though I knew enough in 2015 to make a video about it, I've learned so much more since then, which is why this section is so long. And it's still a condensed version. So stick with me to the end. So not only is this section going to go over some controversial ancient writings found on artifacts, rocks, and caves in North America, but it's also going to go over actual Hebrew and Middle Eastern languages and customs that are still preserved in some Native American tribes even to this day. So for people who insist that there's no evidence of Middle Eastern ancestry in any Native Americans, they just haven't done their research, because again, this video is loaded with examples, which are only the tip of the iceberg of what's available out there to learn. Now there are people out there, especially in U.S. academia, who love to dismiss the tens of thousands of artifacts showing ancient Middle Eastern languages and customs here in North America as fakes. But then how do they explain some of the Middle Eastern languages and customs, particularly Hebrew, that are still preserved among some Native American cultures? Is it just coincidence? Of course not. And I'm going to show you a few examples. Now, I'm not saying that all Native Americans have Hebrew or other Middle Eastern ancestry, but there definitely are some. Now, if you're a Native American watching this video, it may or may not apply to you, depending on what tribes are in your ancestry. If it does apply to you, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So let's get into it. I'm going to start with the name of God. Here are two columns. One column shows the name of God in Hebrew and various pronunciations of it. The other column shows various pronunciations of the name of God or Creator as he is more often called, in various Native American cultures. Look at his name. Coincidence? No. 
Next, I want to show you a list of Algonquin words and phrases from a book printed in 1825 called View of the Hebrews by Ethan Smith. Now, like many books in this time period of the United States, it calls the Native Americans savages, which I don't agree with. Just because the Native American tribes had different cultures than the European settlers doesn't mean they were savages. But anyway, be prepared to see that term in old books like this. So here's a list of words and phrases from View of the Hebrews shown in three columns. The first column is in English. The second column is from Algonquin tribes originally from the eastern United States before the government took their lands and forced them onto reservations. The third column is Hebrew or Chaldaic, which are both Semitic languages. Obviously, columns two and three are spelled out with English letters so that the reader can try to pronounce them as they actually sound. Look how similar these words and phrases are that have been preserved in the Algonquin languages. Some are exact, some are near exact, others are very similar. And look at the type of words and phrases. A lot of them are biblical. This is the real deal. Linguistics like this are not coincidences or fakes. View of the Hebrews is a very informative book, and I suggest you read it. It has many more examples of language, customs, and beliefs preserved among Native Americans that tie into Middle Eastern ancestry. Another excellent book is The Ten Tribes of Israel by Timothy R. Jenkins, printed in 1883. There are many other old books like these. I'm going to give an example of an account from The Ten Tribes of Israel. It's on page 16, and I'll just read it for you here. It says, The following is from Alexander's Messenger, published many years ago in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And again, this book was published in 1883, so many years ago from 1883. Anyway, it goes on to say, A government officer stationed at Lake Superior at an early day, before any white settlers had invaded that part of the country, after becoming acquainted with a number of Indian tribes, found one tribe in possession of a copper tube, tightly soldered. And when asked what it contained, they said they were not able to tell, but they had received it from their ancestors a long time ago. The officer finally prevailed upon them to let him open the article, and when he did so, he found it filled with parchment, with inscriptions that he could not read, but by sending the parchment to Washington City, where it was examined by competent Hebrew scholars, it was declared to be part of the five books of Moses. So that's the first five books of the Bible. Here we have another link in the chain proving that Hebrews were here many years before the white man came to this continent and that the present North American Indians are their descendants. And again, like I said earlier in this video, I'm not saying that every single Native American tribe has Hebrew ancestry in it, but there definitely are some tribes with Hebrew ancestry in them. Anyway, this book, The Ten Tribes of Israel, and also View of the Hebrews, are filled with awesome stories like this. And like I said, there's many other old books like these out there. You just gotta go looking for them and read through them. Now I want to move on to the Mi'kmaq Native Americans from the Northeast U.S. and Southeast Canada. So the Prophet Joseph Smith said that the original metal plates that the Book of Mormon was engraved on had a reformed Egyptian language. Here are some of the characters from the metal plates copied onto paper in the 1820s. Now, look how similar some of these characters are to characters in the written language of the Mi'kmaq tribe whose written language is a form of Egyptian, called Hieratic Egyptian. They had this language before the European settlers even arrived. So even if you don't believe Joseph Smith about the truth of the Book of Mormon, how do the Mi'kmaqs have Hieratic Egyptian as their language? Is it fake? Is it just coincidence? No. It's been handed down from their ancient ancestors. That's how they had it before the European settlers arrived. Now I want to move on to Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce tribe, who were forced westward off their land by the U.S. Army. Chief Joseph's story can easily be found on the internet and in various books. In 1877, Chief Joseph, 
which is his English name, was captured by the army. When they searched his medicine bag, they took out a small tablet from him. He, the chief, said that the tablet had been passed down in his family for many generations, and that they had inherited it from their white ancestors, and that white men had come among his ancestors long ago. The tablet was confirmed by Professor Robert Biggs to be an ancient writing called cuneiform. Robert Biggs was a professor of Assyriology at the Oriental University of Chicago. The tablet was simply a sales receipt for a lamb bought around 2040 BC in the Assyrian Babylonian area of the Middle East. I'll let you read the translation here because I'll butcher the names. Babylon is also the area where the Tower of Babel was built, and the Book of Mormon tells us that the Jaredites came to ancient America sometime after the Tower of Babel. And for anyone who assumes that Chief Joseph was lying about the tablet, take a look at his medicine bag. On his medicine bag is a symbol known as the Star of Asher, which is an ancient symbol for an Assyrian Babylonian god. As of 1971, in honor of that ancient symbol, the Assyrian flag has the Star of Asher on it today. The four-point star has three streams of light going out from between each point. The main difference in Chief Joseph's star is that each stream of light starts out as one stream and then separates into three points at the end. This is not fake. This is not coincidence. This is real. Now I want to talk about the Cherokee tribe. Here is their account of the creation of the world, which you'll find is almost exactly the same as described in the book of Genesis in the Bible. This is in their words. You can just pause the video to read over it. The Cherokee also have a special ceremony in the fall called the Green Corn Ceremony. Take some time to pause the video and look at the similarities of the green corn ceremony in comparison to the special fall ceremonies of Israel. The Muscogee or Creek tribe also have a special fall ceremony called the green corn dance. Now take a look at the similarities between this ceremony and the fall ceremonies of Israel. These two examples of ceremonial similarities are only from two Native American tribes, but there are many more tribes that you can research who also have similar customs and beliefs to the Hebrews. As I've said so many times throughout this video, these are not coincidences. They've been passed down through many generations from their ancient ancestors. Next, I want to talk about the Cheyenne tribe, but I'm going to save that for last because I learned some things from one of their medicine men and it's going to take up a big chunk of this section. I thought about making it a separate video, but it's just so interesting that I want to share it here. So right now, let's go over some artifacts. Each of these artifacts deserves their own video, which I'd like to do in the future, but this video is already long enough as it is, so I'll be brief about the artifacts. So I've shared some examples of Middle Eastern languages and customs that have been handed down through the generations in some Native American tribes. It's there. It's in their tribes. It can't be denied. It's not fake. It's not coincidence. It's fact. Yet, over the entire history of the United States, whenever artifacts are found that are tied to Middle Eastern cultures, U.S. academia always finds a way to make up a story about how they're fake, and anybody who was involved in finding them is just a fraud. Why? Well, that's a whole other video, and again, I'm trying to keep this as short and simple as I can, but it has to do a lot with ideas called Manifest Destiny, the Doctrine of Discovery, and a guy you may have heard of by the name of John Wesley Powell. Now, with the tens of thousands of artifacts found in the U.S. over the last few hundred years, of course there's going to be some fakes. But all of them? Not a chance. 
especially when there are Native American tribes from the eastern U.S. and Canada who have Middle Eastern languages and customs preserved in their cultures to this day. For every story I've heard from U.S. academia to discredit certain artifacts and the people who found them, there's always been a strong counter-argument in defense of the artifacts, which even some professors at Brigham Young University in Utah don't bother to investigate. But just remember, BYU is not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And just because BYU professors and sites like Book of Mormon Central and FairMormon.org teach something that doesn't always mean it's true. So first, on many artifacts from the eastern U.S. and Canada, you'll see this symbol. This is a word in the cuneiform language, which originated in the Middle East shortly after the time of the Tower of Babel. Yet, it is a sacred symbol in many Algonquin tribes right here in North America that has been passed on through the generations from their ancient ancestors. Why is it sacred to these tribes? Because it is the name of the Creator, which is read from right to left, and the name is yod heh Va. Now, like I said, this symbol has been found all over the eastern half of North America, and even out west. But I want to focus right now on what are known as the Michigan relics, many of which have this cuneiform name of God carved on them, as well as Egyptian Assyrian, Phoenician, and Greek characters, and artwork depicting biblical stories. Yet, U.S. academia says that the Michigan relics are all fakes created by some guys named James Scotford, Daniel Soper, and James Savage, starting in 1890 and into the early 1900s. But there are some major problems with these claims. The biggest problem is that even though the Michigan relics were a popular topic from 1890 to the early 1900s, the artifacts were being found as early as the 1840s. Why is this a big problem? Because Daniel Soper wasn't born until 1843. James Savage wasn't born until 1844. And James Scofford wasn't even born until 1852. You see, after Michigan became a state in 1838, people started moving there. And as they began clearing trees and plowing their fields and also digging through the mounds, they would find these artifacts, sometimes even mangled in the roots of very old trees. Signed documents by more than 50 farmers across 27 counties in Michigan show that they found these artifacts on their lands. And by the 1850s and 60s, there were even museums that had some of the artifacts on display. Another big problem is that the Scottford, Soper, and Savage collection is estimated to about 3,000 pieces. Yet, all the Michigan relics total has a low estimate of 10,000 pieces and a high estimate of 30,000 pieces and most of them were made from copper and black slate from the Keweenaw Peninsula, which is on the separate part of Michigan, on the other side of Lake Michigan and above Wisconsin. And ancient copper mines are there, which are estimated to date back as early as the 2000s BC, and in operation, clear up until the 500s AD. And the Adena and Hopewell mound builders were experts in copper and other metal work. And like I said, it wasn't until 1890 that the Michigan relics became well known due to the Scottford, Soper, and Savage collection. Now let's say for the benefit of the doubt that these guys were making fakes. Let's say since they were living in Michigan, they knew about the artifacts that had been found since the 1840s, and they decided to make some fakes and try to get rich and famous. Their 3,000-piece collection is still 7,000 pieces short of the low estimate of Michigan relics. But because U.S. academia says the Scottford Soper Savage collection are fakes, they also dismiss the other seven to 27,000 Michigan artifacts 
and the fact that they were being found as early as the 1840s, before Scotford was even born, and before or around the same time that Soper and Savage were born. And sadly, BYU has this opinion as well. And yes, in the early 1900s, James E. Talmadge did spend time with Soper and Savage investigating their collection and did declare them to be fake. But like I said earlier, it is very possible that the Scotford, Soper, and Savage collection was fake, and therefore very possible that Talmadge was right. But just because he was an apostle, that does not exclude him from having to do his homework. And if he had done more research beyond the Scotford, Soper, Savage collection, he would have found that the Michigan relics were being found way earlier than 1890. He would have found that the Michigan relics were being found clear back in the 1840s, before Scottford, Soper, and Savage were born. And he would have found that there were thousands and thousands more Michigan relics than what was in the Scottford, Soper, Savage collection. So just for clarification, I'm not disagreeing with James E. Talmadge. Regarding the Scottford, Soper, Savage collection, which he investigated and declared to be fake, he could have been right, because again, Scottford, Soper, and Savage could have been making fakes. The problem is, Talmadge didn't do more digging to find out just how far back these Michigan relics were being found. And again, the cuneiform yod heh symbol has been passed down through the generations among Algonquin Native Americans from their ancient ancestors. And it is the name of Creator, and they pronounce it yod heh Even to this day, Another interesting find in Michigan is this carving of a Hebrew menorah in a cave that belongs to the Potawatomi tribe. And the Potawatomi say that this is a sacred symbol from their ancient ancestors. U.S. Academia says it's a pitchfork. But as you probably know, U.S. Academia doesn't care about learning from the Native Americans. Here are some Hebrew carvings found in Connecticut of the names of some biblical prophets. But U.S. Academia says that some guy who just happened to know Hebrew was taking a lunch break from working in the mines and decided to just carve these names into the rock. Here's another artifact called the Bat Creek Stone, found on Cherokee land near Bat Creek in Tennessee in 1889, during an official U.S. archaeological excavation, controlled by the Smithsonian itself. They said it was ancient Cherokee writing and would display it or print it as such. And nobody ever accused the stone of being fake until about 75 years later in the 1960s, when Cyrus Gordon, a professor of Mediterranean studies at Brandeis University, said that the stone had been shown upside down for all those years, and that when turned right side up, the characters engraved on the stone were ancient Hebrew letters that said, For the Judeans. Some other translations vary slightly, but Judeans or Judah is always in there. Well, as soon as people started noticing that, then suddenly U.S. academia started saying, Oh, well, then the stone is fake, even though they found it on their own controlled excavation, and the Smithsonian continued to display it and print it upside down. Well, in recent years, the Cherokee won a U.S. court case to get all of the artifacts and skeleton bones found on that dig back from the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian said they couldn't find the bones, but the Cherokee did get the Back Creek Stone, but there was a condition attached with it. The Cherokee were told by the court that they had to continue to display the stone as it was in the Smithsonian, upside down. So you think about that. There is a great effort by U.S. academia to prevent people from knowing that there is Middle Eastern ancestry within some ancient Native American tribes. And again, sadly, Brigham Young University sides with U.S. academia and many people think that BYU and websites like Book of Mormon Central and FairMormon.org represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but they don't. You can find some good stuff on there, but just remember, 
BYU is not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So do your own research. Don't blindly believe what college professors and their books tell you, even BYU professors. Learn about the artifacts, but regardless of the artifacts, learn about the Middle Eastern language and customs still preserved in some Native American tribes today. Now here's a survey drawing of a unique ancient Hopewell Mound Builder site in Ohio that I talked about in part two. And I've also made a separate video about it called Hebrews Were in Ancient America, which I'll leave a link to in the description box below, and you can learn about it in more detail. Notice the Hebrew oil lamp, the nine candle menorah, and also the compass and the square, all of which have sacred meaning in the Hebrew culture. A survey drawing of this site is included in the Smithsonian's first publication in 1848 called Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis. Yet there are still people who accuse this site of being fake as well. Later, in the early 1900s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers completely leveled this entire site down to the ground. Yet, they left all the other mound builder sites around it alone. So again, you think about that. The site has been said to have been at or near this spot here by Fayetteville, Ohio. And if you notice this field here on the left, there are ditches that form a sacred Hebrew letter called the Sheen, which may have been where the mound builders got the dirt from to build the site, or it could just be a natural formation because there's a lot of similar curvy ditches in the area. But if so, maybe that's why they built it in that area, which isn't a far-fetched idea because the city of Jerusalem in Israel is built on terrain that naturally forms a sheen as well. Here are some other important artifacts that were found in the 1860s in Ohio near a town called Newark, which are also accused of being fake. I've made a more detailed video on these artifacts as well, called The Ten Commandments in Ancient America, which I'll leave a link to in the description box also. Anyway, they were excavated at a mound builder site by a man named David Wyrick and seven or eight other witnesses, and are nicknamed the Newark Holy Stones. The most popular one is called the Decalogue Stone, which was inside the stone case you see behind it, buried with a skeleton at the bottom and center of a very large mound. This stone has the entire Ten Commandments engraved on it in ancient block Hebrew writing. The man in the middle is holding tablets and wearing a turban, and the name above his head says Moshe, which means Moses. The other stone is nicknamed the Keystone, just because that's what it looks like. And it has ancient Hebrew writing on all four sides, which says the King of the Earth, the Word of the Lord, the Laws of Jehovah, and the Holy of Holies. The small stone bowl is also significant because in the Hebrew culture, a vessel was considered impure if it had been made out of clay or something and then cooked to harden. And so if they wanted a pure vessel to hold holy water or oil, they would carve the vessel out of stone. And speaking of the Ten Commandments, Ohio is not the only place where they're found in ancient America. Remember the account earlier in this video from the book The Ten Tribes of Israel about the Native Americans around Lake Superior in the 1800s who had part of the five books of Moses written on parchment in a little copper tube passed on from their ancient ancestors through many generations. And again, the mound builders were experts in copper. Well, the Ten Commandments are mentioned all throughout the five books of Moses, beginning in the second book, Exodus, when the Lord gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Also, the Cheyenne tribe know about the Ten Commandments from their ancient ancestors. And we're about to finally talk about the Cheyenne tribe. But one last thing, the Ten Commandments are also found carved in a boulder in the mountains of Las Lunas, New Mexico. This is another artifact that U.S. academia accuses of being fake. But if you speak with Native Americans in that area who know a lot about it, they'll tell you it was there long before any white explorers came to the area. The stone is still there today, 
but sadly, somebody vandalized it around 2006 and scratched over the top line. But the rest of it is still legible, and with permission, you can go see it. But that's not all. At the top of the mountain is an ancient fort similar to Fort Masada in Israel. There's also an astronomy carving up there, which shows the position of the stars from one night during the year of... I can't remember if it was 107 BC or 107 AD. But how do they know this? Because today, there is software which astronomers use that can mathematically calculate where the stars, planets, moons, comets, etc. were at any night in the past, even that far back in time. Some other things to research in the Southwest are the Tucson-led Arizona artifacts, which are really cool, but I need to learn more about them, and so I'm not going to go into them right now in this video. All right, let's get into the Cheyenne tribe. I have a friend named Sean Little Bear who lives in Oklahoma and is one of the Cheyenne's medicine men, one of their four arrow men, and he's also their record keeper, but I'm not sure if they have more than one of those. Sean is also a seventh generation member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, meaning he had ancestors who joined the church back in its early days in the 1800s. The Cheyenne tribe also have Hebrew-related customs. Back in about the year 2000, the Prime Minister of Israel gave the Cheyenne tribe land to own in Israel because Israel had learned that the Cheyenne were distant relatives of theirs. How did they know this? There's a Jewish ceremony that Israel knew had a missing portion of the ceremony, which their ancestors knew, but they no longer knew it. So they were searching among cultures that they believed had Hebrew ancestry to see if any of those cultures' ceremonies had this missing portion. Well, they found this missing portion in the Cheyenne tribe, because the Cheyenne performed this same particular Jewish ceremony, only they performed the complete version of it. So Israel had finally found this missing portion of the ceremony, and in return, the prime minister gave land in Israel to the Cheyenne tribe. Sean is one of the four arrow men in the Cheyenne tribe and has been invited by Israel to be in the ceremony when they perform it. That is not coincidence or fake. Now this land that the Cheyenne owns in Israel has a hill on it. It is one of three hills that are sacred to the Cheyenne people. Sean has told me about the other two hills. One of them is Bear Butte Mountain in South Dakota. The Cheyenne call it the Holy Sacred Walking Mountain. The reason for these names and why the mountain is sacred to them is because they say that a very long time ago, an army of their enemies were coming to attack their ancestors. And there was a great prophet among their ancestors who told them that if they had faith in the Creator, that the Creator would save them from the army. Then the prophet commanded the mountain to rise up, move over the army, and land on top of them. They say it looked like a giant walking bear. Sean says this is Mount Zarin, spoken of in Ether chapter 12, verse 30 in the Book of Mormon, only it doesn't give all the details. It just says that the brother of Jared was able to move Mount Zarin by faith in God. The Cheyenne still gather at Bear Butte Mountain to this day. The other hill that is sacred to the Cheyenne people is the Hill Cumorah in Palmyra, New York. The hill spoken of in the Book of Mormon where the last of the Jaredites and the Nephites were killed off at different periods in history, who also match up with the Edina and Hopewell mound builder cultures. And archaeology and Native Americans tell us that the Hopewell mound builder culture ended in New York around 400 AD. The reason this hill is sacred to the Cheyenne people is because they say that a record of their ancient ancestors was buried in it and would one day come out of the hill and bless the whole world. They compare it to seeds being planted in the hill and fruit growing from those seeds that would bless the whole world. And the Hill Cumorah is where the prophet Moroni buried the ancient metal record called the Book of Mormon in about 421 AD. 
And 1400 years later, in 1823 AD, Moroni appeared as an angel to a 17-year-old boy named Joseph Smith, who lived in Palmyra at the time. And Moroni finally let Joseph take the metal record out of the hill four years later in 1827, when Joseph was 21 years old. Over the next three years, with the help of God, Joseph translated the ancient record, which was a reformed Egyptian similar to what the Mi'kmaq tribe had, into the English language. And it was published in 1830, when Joseph was 24 years old, and is called the Book of Mormon. And since then, it has blessed millions of people all around the world by bringing them closer to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and His plan of happiness. And the Book of Mormon tells of how ancient Native Americans knew who Jesus Christ was, and that He actually visited them and spent time with them after His resurrection. And there's an excellent book called He Walked the Americas by Taylor Hansen, a non-Mormon author who spent much of her life with Native Americans and learned that most of them had an account in their culture of a great white god or prophet who spent time with their people and performed miracles and taught them many things. So I suggest reading that book as well. These three sacred hills to the Cheyenne are not fake. This is the real deal. And earlier, I said that Sean Little Bear was a seventh generation member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So back in the 1800s, in the early days of the church, many Cheyenne people were baptized and joined the church. They could hardly understand English at the time, so they could hardly understand the missionaries or read the Book of Mormon unless there was a translator to help. But the reason why they joined the church was because there was a Cheyenne prophecy that had been with their people since around 1200 AD. So that's long before the Europeans came to America. This prophecy described a young man whom they called All Sewn Up Man, because when they saw him in detail in the vision, he was a white man dressed in very fine woven material rather than the thicker woven material they were used to, and the only things that weren't covered by his clothes were his hands and his head from the chin up. The prophecy said that all sewn up man would find a record of their ancestors in a hill. So in the 1800s, when two missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints told them about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, they'd already had that prophecy for 600 years, and they knew they needed to be baptized and join the church. And although they didn't move west to Utah with the rest of the church, there were Cheyenne people who would seek out members of the church to be baptized clear up until Sean's day. That's how Sean is a seventh generation member of the church. I also mentioned that Sean is the record keeper for the Cheyenne people. The Cheyenne and many other tribes whom they associate with have many ancient records that they keep safely hidden and guarded in caves because they don't want the U.S. government to take them and destroy them as they've done with so many other Native American artifacts and cities. Mainstream U.S. academia would have us believe that Native Americans don't have any written history or language, which is absolutely false. Sean says the Cheyenne and many other tribes they associate with have records of their people recorded on booklets, bark, leather, bones, and the most ancient records are preserved on stone tablets and metal plates and are written in Egyptian hieroglyphs, Phoenician, and Hebrew. There are so many other Hebrew and early Christian beliefs preserved in the Cheyenne culture, such as the story of Adam and Eve, the Ten Commandments, as I mentioned earlier, and sacred temple symbols of creation, including the compass and the square. And the Cheyenne leadership was organized the exact way that Jesus Christ had organized his church while he was on the earth, both in Jerusalem, as mentioned in the Bible, and in ancient America, as mentioned in the Book of Mormon. And that organization is a chief apostle with two apostles under him and twelve apostles under them. The Cheyenne used to have a chief with two under him and twelve under them in leadership. 
This type of leadership ended when the U.S. government were trying to get the head Cheyenne chief to sign away their lands to the United States and give the chief an English name. The chief's real name was Ben Whiteshield, which is a Hebrew name, and he told them that he had Hebrew ancestry and didn't want an English name and didn't want to sign over the Cheyenne lands to the United States. Well, sadly, as we know, the United States ended up taking the Cheyenne's land anyway. And along that topic, I need to mention the U.S. Indian Removal Act of 1830, otherwise known as the Trail of Tears, where the United States wrongly justified taking away the lands of the Native American tribes and forcing them to move onto reservations on the other side of Arkansas, Missouri, and Iowa, which was then the western border of the United States. This is why so many Native American tribes are still in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska to this day. But the Cheyenne also know of the great city, Zion, or the New Jerusalem, which will one day be built in the United States when God gives this land back to the Native Americans. Although it probably won't be called the United States at that time. Read carefully what Jesus Christ says to the Nephites and the Lamanites in 3 Nephi chapter 21 and particularly in verses 22 through 24. You'll see that it's their descendants, the Native Americans, who are the remnant of Jacob, whose other name is Israel. They will be the people in charge of building the New Jerusalem. And then the Gentiles, who are all of the other people on this land who choose to follow Jesus Christ and join the house of Israel, they will come and assist the Native Americans. And God told Joseph Smith that the center of Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be where Independence, Missouri is. Now look at where Independence, Missouri is. It's right by all those Native American reservations. The Trail of Tears was a horrible thing, but God has a way of causing horrible things to work out for the good of his people. And when it's time for the New Jerusalem to be built, the remnant of Jacob, the Native Americans, are right where the Creator needs them to be so they can take charge of building the great city, the New Jerusalem. Now, are there any Native American tribes that we know of from the scriptures, the prophet Joseph, and church history who are descendants of Hebrews from the Book of Mormon? Yes, there are. And I plan on making a more detailed video about this, but for right now, I'll just tell you the tribes, and here are the sources for you to go read on your own. The specific tribes mentioned that I know of are the Seneca, the Wyandot, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Sac, the Fox, and the Potawatomi. But in general, the Prophet Joseph said, from the 1830s clear up until the year he died in 1844, that the tribes at the western border of the United States were descendants of the people in the Book of Mormon. And the Lord himself said that was the border of the Lamanites, the line between Jew and Gentile, the Lamanites being of Jewish descent, and the white settlers are the Gentiles. And remember, it was the Gentiles, the United States, who forced the Native Americans off their homelands in the east, along the Trail of Tears, to that western border. Now, does that mean that every single tribe in the area of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska have Hebrew ancestors? I don't know. But as I've talked about earlier in this video, the Potawatomi do have Hebrew ancestry, and so do the Seneca, the Wyandot, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Sac, and the Fox. I've also talked in this video about the Cherokee, Muscogee, and Cheyenne, and they all do as well. And all of these tribes, as well as many others, were forced to that western border by the United States. Now, I don't know about the Mi'kmaq. They may have been skipped since they were mainly in Canada. And I think the Nez Perce were already west of that border. And so I don't think they were affected until the U.S. started moving further west and forcing them off their lands. Sean Little Bear and the Cheyenne tribe associate with all of the tribes in that area, and he tells me that most of them have Hebrew ancestry. So there's my long video. I hope it was worth the wait, and I hope you enjoyed it. 
It took me a while to go through my notes and compile and condense this information. There's so much more good stuff to share that's not mentioned in this video. So much more good stuff to learn and so many people who have helped me learn this stuff over the years. I recommend checking out what they have to share as well. Here are some of their names, but I'm sure I'm forgetting some of them, so I apologize. I just go to a lot of conferences where I talk with all these good people and listen to what they've learned as well. They have books, DVDs, and videos online, and can also recommend a whole lot of non-Mormon sources, both new and old, clear back to the colonial and the early U.S. history days. But most importantly, if you talk with the Native Americans and listen to them, they can take you back even further than that. It's important to listen to what the Native Americans have to say, because they can tell us so much more than U.S. academia can. And U.S. academia doesn't always tell the truth. And those among them who do are often ridiculed, discredited, and victims of character assassination. So like I always say, do your own research, and you'll find out that a lot of Native American tribes have Hebrew and Middle Eastern ancestry, regardless of whether you believe that Joseph Smith just learned and capitalized on that knowledge to create the Book of Mormon and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or you believe that he was a real prophet of God. I believe he was. And I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did visit ancient Native American tribes, as talked about not only in the Book of Mormon, but many Native American cultures. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. Good for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I just want to give a reminder to check out the link in the description box below to find out how you can watch the short film Reign of Judges for free by December 13th and what you can do to help fund the full feature film.